It is clear in the scriptures that it was always necessary from the very beginning for there to be two advents of the Messiah. There are many fold reasons for this, such as the necessity for the Messiah to be cut off for a reconciliation for iniquity, and then a good message to be delivered to those who are being reconciled, namely the dispersed. But while Christ redeemed his people at the appointed time, he would also of course not forget of his promised seven times punishment, which was yet ongoing and still not perfected. This is one of the many reasons why there had to be two advents, and why Christ did not usher in the kingdom during his first. Neither would Yahweh forget some of the most ultimate prophecies, such as those concerning the turning of Esau's sword against his brother in the time of Jacob's trouble. This is where we are today, and this is where we bear the promise of our ultimate redemption and release from captivity. So these two advents were forever necessary, and both of these advents have a distinct pouring out of the Spirit promised alongside with them. In the prophecies, this is often compared with the concept of an early and a latter rain, and this was a critical agricultural process of ancient Israel, and it is a metaphor which the people would have readily recognized. The book of Joel is one of the most memorable places where this early and latter rain is promised, and it says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. The literal early rain which is the base for this prophecy and this metaphor, it would feed the crops of Judea around the beginning of our November, after the sowing of seed. That's pretty important. And the latter would come towards the end of our April, in preparation of the harvest, also equally important. In between these two rains, there is a general dry period, and there's also symbolism there. This agricultural process was used in the prophets to symbolically represent the building up of the reconciled body of Christ. And for this reason, Yahshua often compared both his mission and even the very nature of the world to a field expecting harvest. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. The apostles were given a mission to bear the news of the reconciliation of divorced Israel and to deliver it to those lost sheep. This mission began in earnest after Yahshua had accomplished his objectives of the first advent, chiefly dying as the husband to release the wife from the penalty of the law and then giving her a marriage invitation in the form of the resurrected Christ. To aid the apostles in the accomplishment of their mission, to spread this news of reconciliation, the Creator gave them signs and wonders, showing the efficacy of His word, and this was one of the core reasons why early Christianity spread so quickly. This was the first pouring out of the Spirit, just mentioned earlier in Joel. Peter also recognized this. Fifty days after Passover, there was Pentecost, and therefore fifty days after the crucifixion, Christ being crucified on a Passover, the apostles received this deposit of the Spirit, this early rain, which Joel referred to, during Pentecost, just as Yahshua had promised them. The Holy Spirit is often connected with abilities for men to either give or interpret prophecy. The book of Joel 
also connects this deposit of the Spirit with wondrous gifts, which Peter then quoted after receiving his own apportionment of the early reign. Peter himself was given such wondrous gifts. People would be healed even stepping into his shadow. As it is recorded in Acts, and Peter is recorded as saying, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. Paul also recognized this inheritance. But Paul, of course, also knew that if there is an early reign, there must also be a latter reign, just as it was promised in the prophets. This is why Paul chose to refer to this gift of the Spirit, which the apostles received at Pentecost. He referred to it as a deposit of the Spirit. Paul used this word in the same sense as a man who would make a deposit of money or some other valuable good in expectation of receiving a greater inheritance in the future. The prophecy of Joel also recognized that the early reign is not as of great power as the coming latter reign, where it says, For he has given you the former reign moderately. Of course, there has been a dry period since then, as we await the return of Christ. But we do expect the latter reign at his second coming, and we may also expect gifts such as these. Or the latter reign may also simply represent the very state of our resurrected bodies. It's only conjecture, and we'll have to wait and see. But conjecture aside, just as there was a long period between the literal, agricultural, early and latter rains in Judea, so there would be a period of waiting in between the prophetic advents. It's an important lesson here. The wait was destined to be long, for the perfection of the seven times punishment alone would take 2,520 years. Therefore, all these things considered, James recognized a necessary period between the two reigns, a long period. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter reign. This can bring to memory the allegory seen in the Song of Solomon of the woman waiting for her husband. And it can bring to memory the duty of the guests awaiting the arrival of the bridegroom in the parables of Christ. We should not be found sleeping. As Christ taught in his teachings, the world is not made up of all the same plans, but it also includes strange plans, tares, whom God did not plant, descendants of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and mixed with the fallen angels. While the apostles were healthy-minded and did not ever dare deliver or dream of giving the message to such outsiders, later Christians would later become deceived in prophesied times of apostasy. This was prophesied by Christ in his parable of the net and in his parable of the wedding garments, just for examples its prophetic necessity being only emphasized through other prophecies, such as the final captivity of Israel and Babylon, surrounded by her enemies, and the sowing of men with the seed of beasts during this time. So because of these things, over time, the field and many congregations have become infiltrated with such strange plants. Therefore, the plants which are in the field of this harvest of the coming latter rain are not just wheat, 
They are not just sheep or good fish, but outsiders, aliens. These are the outsiders condemned from of old, who have crept in unawares, and this is why Christ presents the tares as growing among the wheat in anticipation of the ultimate harvest as a prelude to the coming of the Son of Man. As Christ is recorded as saying in relation to the coming harvest of the latter rain, in Matthew, from the parable, He, representing Christ, Yahweh God, said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Will you then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. It can't root up the wheat. No one will pluck any sheep from the Father's hand. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn that being the kingdom. These parables only open up to us when we look at them through the perspective of the early and latter rain. We can remember that these literal rains were at a time of planting and a latter time of harvest, respectively. So the prophetic early rain is placed at the beginning of the body of Christ's story during its reconciliation and the latter rain is placed at the end of the body of Christ's story, at the harvest of the wheat and the tares. In the parable of this harvest, we of course see the tares are binded in bundles to be burned, representing the lake of fire. And taking this all into mind, if we go back and look at Joel, this is a core reason as to why we know that that prophecy was only fulfilled partially. When Peter was looking back at it, he wasn't looking back at a complete fulfillment of that prophecy, as if that prophecy is now behind us and has no further fulfillment, because there are dimensions of the prophecies which are explicitly unfulfilled. He was only speaking of the moderate, early reign. Remember, Joel prophesied of both reigns. The clue evident to us in Joel is this, that in Joel, in connection to the pouring out of this spirit, we also see a promised destruction of the cankerworms and the palmer worms, which are identified as the parasitic peoples whom Yahweh had sent to scourge Israel in punishment, both then in the near vision and especially now in the far vision. And they are completely destroyed in the prophecy, and their destruction certainly did not happen at the time of Pentecost, because they are still here today. In Joel, speaking of this burning of the tares, it says, But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. Then later on in Joel it says in regards to the wheat, And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. There's prosperity. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And Yahweh does certainly send this army. As we see in Ezekiel, he puts hooks into their jaws and brings them here to Israel to surround the camp of the saints in our punishment. But he also gives a promise that it is here where he will destroy them. They are coming for their destruction and for Yahweh's glorification. This is why the kingdom, as it is promised in the prophecies, is a place where there are no more strangers to consume and to be parasitic, just as they were in the past. Israel can blossom and bud in peace. Going back to Joel in this great army which Yahweh has sent, we see in Revelation the camp of the saints 
surrounded by the same army of cankerworms and palmer worms, but there they are referred to as Gog and Magog. But this is just another angle of the same prophecy. This reference of Gog and Magog was first given in Ezekiel. And when we compare Joel and Ezekiel 38 and 39, the passage about Gog and Magog, it is very evident that they are speaking about the same thing. Notice that where he says in Joel, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up. We can compare this to Ezekiel, where we read, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, just like in Joel, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, that stink mentioned in Joel. And there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the Valley of Hamon Gog. If we put all of these prophecies together, we notice something. We notice that the canker worms and the palmer worms are also Gog and Magog, and we notice in Revelation that Gog and Magog and the destruction of them in fire because the tares are bundled in fire. We notice that that army precipitates the second coming. The second coming happens in this same period of time. So this is indeed the final harvest at the end of the age, which Christ spoke about in his parable of the wheat and the tares, which in that parable, it also precipitated the second coming. Therefore, we shouldn't at all be surprised to see a promise of the latter rain given afterwards in Ezekiel just after their destruction, just as it was in Joel. It isn't called in Ezekiel the latter rain, but it's very evident that it's talking about the same thing, where Yahweh says in Ezekiel, Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith Yahweh God. The wheat have now finally been gathered into Yahshua's barn. This pouring out of the Spirit is the same language which Yahweh used in regards to the early and latter rains in Joel, where he said, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Notice here in Ezekiel, For I have poured out my Spirit upon the house of Israel, so that helps us define all flesh there in Joel. It's all the flesh of the house of Israel. It's not the flesh of the canker worms. We see in Ezekiel that after the wheat are gathered, it even takes them seven months, either literal months or prophetic, to bury the strange plants who have been threshed in the fields, where it says at 39.12, in seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. This is the very nature of threshing, of the harvest. And this is why the harvest is related as a violent thing in other prophecies, such as where in Revelation, the blood is symbolically described as reaching the bridles of the horses. And even Christ said in the Gospels, that wherever the bodies are, there the eagles will be gathered to get their fill from their flesh. The harvest at the time of the latter rain is a violent harvest. It's a harvest of men, a threshing of the aliens, the cankerworms and the palmer worms, whom Yahweh has sent, for they have only existed as a parable, as a lesson, an exercise in vanity and of chastisement and judgment against Israel. Their very purpose has now been exhausted, for Israel's time of her exercise in vanity has been completed. This harvest precipitates the second coming, as we see in Revelation. So it must happen in Mystery Babylon, and we see that in Micah too. The Bible is harmonious from Genesis to Revelation. In Micah, we see that it is in Babylon where Israel will get 
her final release from captivity. That prophecy in Micah was never fulfilled in the Babylon of the Chaldees. In Mystery Babylon, we see in Revelation that those who come out from the system after its fall, after its collapse, they are told by the angel to deal back to her double. That is, of course, violent. What do we see afterwards? We see Christ coming to make war. This dealing back to her double is, of course, parallel to a rise and thresh, a threshing of the harvest, a threshing of the tares, as seen in Micah, and that prophecy in Micah chapter 4 also is described as taking place in Babylon. This is again all the same harvest seen in Joel and Ezekiel, and that's why the term threshing is being used. In regards to this threshing, we can glean even more information if we look at Hosea, because in Hosea we see a very subtle promise in regards to the harvest. First, we get a signal that these prophecies in this passage of Hosea can transcendentally revolve around the time of the latter rain, where it says in Hosea, Then shall we know, if we follow on to know Yahweh, his going forth, his advents, is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. And then later in the prophet we read, Also, O Judah, he is set to harvest for thee, when I return the captivity of my people. When the harvest of the latter rain occurs, this is the time when Israel is returned from her captivity because it's the time of the second advent, and we've been in captivity for over 2,000 years. As we saw in Micah and in Revelation, Israel's final destination on the road to the second advent is Mystery Babylon. And this is another step in the same series of captivities which have been ongoing since the Assyrians first began taking the people of Ephraim. This is why Yahweh connects the latter rain with the release from captivity, because when Babylon falls and Christ comes to usher in his kingdom, we are indeed released. In Micah, we read, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shall you go forth out of the city, and ye shall dwell in the field, and ye shall go even to Babylon. This is mystery Babylon of Revelation. There shall you be delivered. There Yahweh shall redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Those enemies are the canker worms and the palmer worms. This is all well and good. But why does Yahweh give a specific promise to Judah? in regards to this harvest. For this we find our answer in another prophecy of the latter rain, this time found in Zechariah. First, Yahweh transcendentally dates the fulfillment of this prophecy to the time of the latter rain, where he says at Zechariah 10.1, Ask ye of Yahweh rain in the time of the latter rain, so Yahweh shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. There's no mention of early rain here in Zechariah, so that's why it's interesting that the things which follow this prophecy aren't about planting, no, they're about harvesting. So, we see Yahweh announce that the tribe of Judah will, either symbolically or literally, lead this charge of the great harvest where Yahweh says, My anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. That should be translated chiefs. For Yahweh of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and has made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Out of him came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, 
out of him every oppressor together. And they shall be as mighty men, which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight, because Yahweh is with them, and their riders on horses shall be confounded. And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am Yahweh their God, and will hear them. That mercy, being as if they weren't cast off, that's the people who were made not a people, being made a people again. Divorce Israel, of course. So we see here Judah leading the charge, and here we see the battle bow coming out of Judah. This is not the first time Judah is recorded as leading a charge in battle. As we see recorded in Judges, now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked Yahweh, saying, Who shall go up for us? against the Canaanites first, to fight against them. And Yahweh said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. So Judah goes first. Judah leads the charge against the Canaanites here. And this can be read as prophetic for the final destruction of the Canaanites at the time of the final harvest, which we await where it says in Zechariah concerning that day, And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of Yahweh of hosts. We also see in Zechariah another promise of the pouring out of the Spirit, the same pouring out of the Spirit which we saw after the harvest is completed in Joel and in Ezekiel. This is the latter rain. If the people of Israel had succeeded at driving out their enemies completely at the time of Judges and Joshua, then Yahweh would have given them rest. The rest which Yahweh promised was in connection to the destruction of these enemies. But of course, they failed, so they didn't receive the rest. This is why we must turn our eyes towards the skies and await for the second Joshua to finish where we had originally failed in the past. It is at this time that we will finally receive that rest. As Paul says, a period of rest remains for the people of Yahweh. And just as Joshua and David, who were both types for Christ, were warriors, so is Yahshua himself at the time of his second coming. People sometimes get confused, because at the time of the early reign, Christ had an objective. He came to reconcile Israel to himself. He came to serve others and to be an example for us, putting himself last so that he could have a rightful place as first in the kingdom. The early reign was a time of planting. The latter reign is a time of harvest and therefore has an entirely different kind of scope. And therefore Christ, during the second coming, he doesn't come as a man of sorrows, but he comes as a king, ready to make war, just as he is described in the Revelation. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The winepress 
which he treads is important. In Revelation, we see the harvest of the wheat and tares described, but it's described as a harvest of grapes. This is an allegory which can direct the reader to the harvest of the sour grapes in Jeremiah, where Yahweh had said he would sow the seed of man with the seed of beast. Or, in comparison to the sour grape of Sodom, Therefore, again, the ultimate harvest through this comparison to sour grapes is again reminiscent of a time where bad fish are being reeled in. And this has all happened in Babylon. And this is why Babylon is described as a cage for every unclean bird. Those birds who nest in the branches of the kingdom, who force their way in, but those canker worms and those palmer worms will soon be harvested. The blood from the winepress of the sour grapes is described in Revelation as reaching the bridles of the horses. When we consider the fact that Yahshua takes a part in this destruction of his enemies, in this destruction of the canker worms and the palmer worms and the tares, this treading of the winepress which is ascribed to him in Revelation, we should not at all be surprised when we read this description here of the Messiah in Isaiah 63 verses 1 to 4. Who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I, that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in your apparel, and thy garments like him that treads in the wine fat? I have tread in the wine press alone, and of the people there is none with me, for I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance, is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. The harvest is often referred to as the day of Yahweh's vengeance in the Old Testament, and the year of my redeemed there is the ushering in of the kingdom. The mention of Edom in this prophecy can of course be cross-referenced to the ultimate destruction of the Edomites prophesied in Obadiah, in which we still await the fulfillment of. The garments of Christ are described both here and in Revelation as being red with blood from treading the winepress, which is the harvest, that same harvest of Joel, of Ezekiel, that harvest promised to Judah for them to lead the charge in Hosea and in Zechariah. With these prophecies of a warrior messiah we can perfectly understand why Yahweh said to Judah in Hosea, Also, O Judah, he has set a harvest for you when I return the captivity of my people. Because which tribe is Christ from? Christ is the Lion of Judah. He is the ensign raised up against the nations, who fights in the day of battle and gives an ultimate destruction of his enemies, alongside with his people Israel, all threshing together. There are several messianic psalms, which also credit the Messiah, and prophetically also his body, the body of Christ, with feats such as these. In Psalm 118 we read, All nations compassed me about, but in the name of Yahweh will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of Yahweh I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees, they are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of Yahweh I will destroy them. David, who wrote that psalm, is a type for Christ, and often when we read his psalms, which are messianic, we can read his words as being the words of Christ, such as where we read, 
They pierced my hands and my feet. The dogs have surrounded me. It's the first person. So when we read, I will destroy them, they compassed me about like bees. We can read this as the body of Christ, but we can also read it as Christ speaking as well. This surrounding mentioned here is, of course, the armies of Gog and Magog, the cankerworms and the palmer worms surrounding the camp of the saints at the time of the harvest of the latter rain. There's another psalm we can refer to, such as from Psalm 110, where we read, speaking of the Messiah, He shall judge among the heathen, he shall fill the places with the dead bodies, he shall wound the heads over many countries. Because as we see in Haggai, he's inheriting them all. It is no mistake that Psalm 118 is a messianic prophecy. No one can argue about that. For Christ himself quoted it in reference to himself at Matthew 21.42, Mark 12.10, and others. And Peter quoted from it in reference to Christ at 1 Peter 2.7. It is no mistake that Psalm 110 is a messianic prophecy too, for Christ quoted from it in reference to himself in places such as Matthew 22.44. And Paul quoted from it in reference to Christ at Hebrews 1.5 and 1.13, for example. David was a prophet. Christ related him as much in Luke 24, 44, and this is why so many psalms are prophetic. The Spirit was given to David to give prophecy. David was also a warrior, much like Christ, who is a warrior messiah, and Christ is a warrior messiah of the harvest at the time of the latter rain. When you come to understand this, you can observe something which is pretty interesting. At the time of the first advent, the people were expecting this prophesied warrior messiah who would liberate them from the Romans and usher in the kingdom. But instead, they received a man of sorrows. Now, at the time of the second advent, many people are expecting a man of sorrows, but they will instead receive a warrior messiah. Both times does Yahweh make foolish the wisdom of this society, and he glorifies himself. So we have seen that in the prophecies of Joel, Hosea, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Revelation, and in the words of Christ in the Gospels, and in the Psalms, that the latter rain is connected to the harvest, the destruction of God's enemies. And this is all fitting because the latter rain was always literally agriculturally connected with the harvest. Yahweh chose this metaphor for a reason. We can perhaps look at the harvest of the enemies of God, in a sense, as an atonement for our mistakes of the past and for the days where we failed to make this harvest during the time of the first Joshua. This all encapsulates the prophesied marriage supper of the Lamb, a final sacrifice and sweet aroma to Yahweh at the time when he marries Israel unto himself forever. Paul wrote that a day of rest remains for the people of Yahweh, mainly because they had failed to attain the rest at the time of Joshua. It bears mentioning a second time that Yahweh had explicitly connected this rest with the destruction of his enemies. That is why, when they are destroyed, we get the rest. We enter the kingdom. We can dwell in peace. No strangers will again pluck them down. As we read in Hosea 2.15, And I will give her her vineyards from thence, that prosperity in the other prophecies, in the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. 
because it's also, again, a release from captivity, much like when it was in Egypt. Another from Isaiah. They shall not build, and another inhabit. They shall not plant, and another eat. Planting and another eating is a canker worm, or a locust, or a palmer worm, eating all of your crop. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of Yahweh, and their offspring with them. The people at this time have received the latter rain. And as Paul writes at 1 Corinthians, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Thank you for watching, and praise Yahweh, the God of Israel.